Okay, good evening everybody and thank you for joining us on this beautiful Tuesday evening, Tuesday afternoon as we are studying together Perkei Avot, chapter 5 and we are beginning today a new Mishnah. Before we begin a new Mishnah, I just want to touch on one more point on yesterday's Mishnah. If you will remember yesterday we spoke about the 10 miracles that happened in Egypt to the Jewish people. The 10 makot that happened in Egypt to the Egyptians. The 10 miracles that happened to the Jewish people in the uh, Yam Suf, okay, in the desert. Okay, Asara Nisim happened at the Yam. Next, we then went on to the 10 times that we tested Hashem. Okay, we tried God. 10 times, which we learned yesterday, very powerful lesson, that no matter how many miracles a person experiences in their life, you can see Hashem, black and white, miracle of miracles, the sea splitting, the man coming from the heavens, water from a rock, not just like a little water, Niagara Falls, for 3 million people in the desert for 40 years. I mean, how is that not evidence of Hashem? And still with all of this, the Jewish people tested God 10 times, which we saw yesterday was a powerful lesson in itself, how sometimes seeing is not believing. People say today, Rabbi, I just want to see, and if all, all you can do is just show me God once and I'll believe God. And we learned yesterday, not necessarily true. If a person doesn't want to believe, you can show them the greatest miracles in history and they will deny God. And if a person wants to believe, you can show him a simple miracle, something even that may appear natural, and they will believe in God. Okay, it's really up to us. There is one other powerful question over here. You know, the Torah tells us how we, we tried Hashem time and again. Asara nisyonot nisu avotenu. As an example, as an example, right? What are the times that we tried Hashem? I'll just list to you where in the desert we tested Hashem and, and we kind of showed a lack in faith in God. One example, when the Egyptians were chasing us at Yamsuf, they said to Moses, are you ready for this? Here, this is coming, what I'm about to tell you is coming from the mouth of people that witnessed 10 plagues and the exodus. And on their way out, when they were standing at Yam Suf, and there was nowhere to go, there was the water in front of them, there was the Egyptians behind them, they turned and said to Moses, why did you bring us out here to die? We would prefer to be slaves to the Egyptians in Egypt. Better to be slaves than to die out here. And God's like, hello, <laughs> I'm right here. I'm going to figure it out, but come on, guys, do you not have faith in me? Did I not prove myself enough times for you? Right? The Jewish people should have just said, All right, God, I mean, just do what you got to do. I'm not sure what you're going to do, but you've been doing it all along. So go ahead. Chabod, Peticha, Kohen, Bechavod, Aliyat Kohen. God, go ahead. Wherever you come on, let's go. God. They should have just showed and expressed their faith in Him. But they said, Why did God bring us out here to just get killed like this? And that was an example of where they tried Hashem. Okay, another example. There was nothing to drink. They crossed Yam Suf. Okay, fine. You tell me the Makot, they didn't know. Da -da 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 -da. Fine, now God splits the sea. Yeah, can we all agree that that's a very nice miracle? Very nice miracle. Very nice. Okay, that was a very nice miracle. And what happens? They get to a place with bitter water. And they complain and they say, Moshe, why would you bring us to a place with no water to die? We wish we were in Egypt. Again, complain. Then they complained when they ran out of food. Now what are we going to do, Moses? Then they left man extra, even though they were, they were explicitly warned, don't leave anything extra. Again, they tested Hashem. Then they left the camp on Shabbat to gather man. We're not allowed to bring in food to our home because it's carrying. You're not allowed to carry something from public domain to private domain on Shabbat. When the man fell from the heavens, Moses said to the people, don't bring it in. Not allowed to carry. There's going to be enough from Friday for Shabbat. But of course, the Jews, some Jews at least, went out on Shabbat to see 
that there's going to be food. And we know what happened over there, right? Some Jews actually on purpose left food. They, they went Friday night quickly out. They hid some food in the front yards. And their goal was to show the next day, Oh, look, Moses. Mm-hmm. I see some food over here. Huh, what's going on? I thought you said uh, no man's coming down today. <laughs> well, did you take a look at that? There's some man over here. And they were going to expose Moshe and God. What happened? Anyone know what happened? That first week of man, the birds came and ate all the man up. And so Nadav and Aviyu, those two guys, the wicked, the troublemakers, when they went out and they wanted to show the man, and right, there was no man, and they felt like idiots. Um, it was thanks to the birds. And because of that, we reward the birds, we feed them. There's a custom, especially on Perashat Beshalach, which is the episode of the man. We throw some of the bread and the crumbs to the board, to the birds as a reward for what they did over here, eating the food, sabotaging the sabotagement of Nadav and Avihu. Okay, um, that's again, these are just a few examples. Um, they complained against Moses when their water ran out at Refidim. They worshipped the golden calf. They rebelled against God's commandments. They complained that the man was not good enough. Could you imagine you complain about the man? Whoever complained about man? It's like saying Lach Majin doesn't taste good. Whoever would ever say that? They gotta be crazy, right? Okay? And then they believed the spies about Israel. Okay? They believed the report of the spies. So a lot of times the Jewish people tested HaKadosh Baruch Hu and complained. And you know, there's a lot of even, even more than 10 in the Midrash. You ready for this one? When they crossed the Am Suf, the Jewish people, get, what happens guys when there's water mixed in with sand? What do you get? Mud. Right? You get mud. Well, the Jewish people, God just split the sea for them and it was a little bit of mud. A little bit. Just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of mud. And if I was a Jew, and God just split the sea for me, and I just got saved from the Egyptians, I wouldn't mind the mud. And yet the Midrash tells us that as the Jews were crossing, you ready for this? There were certain Jews and they said, well, would you look at this? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Look at this, mud, mud in the water. <coughs> we had mud back in Egypt. What do we gain by coming out here? We were surrounded by mud all day. We should have just stayed in Egypt. Could you imagine? God just split the sea for you. And the only thing you have to complain about and to say is, oh, why is there mud on my shoes? Ugh, right? For real? That's your thank you? And the answer is that in life, certain people will complain no matter what. It says, that's what it says. This is the Midrash, by the way. I'm not telling you me. If it was me, you could argue on me. I'm just Moise. I'm just telling you what the Midrash says. The Midrash says that there were some people, the water was a little bit muddy. Yes, it was definitely dry, and that was one of the ten miracles. But maybe a part of it was muddy. Maybe it wasn't as dry as they wanted. I don't know what to tell you. But this is what the Midrash says. And there are some people that will complain no matter what you bring them in life. You give them the nicest thing, and they still will find something wrong with it, right? And this is something that we have to, we have to um, realize and, and appreciate. Um, and by the way, a lot of times the reason people complain, right? Why do people complain? I think if we understood the psychology behind it, we would be a little bit more, A, patient with them, and B, if it's us that are complaining, we would maybe be able to get a little bit out of the rut that we're always in, in a complaining mood. No matter what's going on over here, um, we're always complaining, right? Why do people complain? The Pasuk says that when the Jewish people got to um, a place called Mara, Mara, they couldn't drink the water. Kimarim Hem. What does that mean, Kimarim Hem? Because they were bitter. How would you translate that? They couldn't drink the water because they were bitter. Simply, they couldn't drink the water because they, the water, was bitter. And that's why I buy Kirkland. <laughs> okay, free advertising. But, you ready for this? The Kutzka Rebbe says they couldn't drink the water because they, not the water, because they were bitter. 
The Jews were bitter. And if you are bitter, doesn't matter if I give you the sweetest water in the world, you'll find it bitter. If you're having a bad day, some people just they like to complain or they want to complain, right? You ever see this? Sometimes our kids, they come home from, a bad, from, from school and they're in a bad mood. It doesn't matter. You made them their favorite sushi. You made them their favorite dinner. You could buy them La Marais, reserve cut. You could get them whatever you want. Doma, if you live in five towns, doesn't matter. Whatever you do, they're in a bad mood and they're going to complain, right? Sometimes in life, we're just in a complain mode. Right? We're just, we're not happy. We're in, a, we're in a very bad place. We're in a very bad space. And no matter what, everything and anything will bother me. This one's no good. My teacher, the food, too salty, too sweet, too this, too that. Why is the plate? Why is the hat? Right? And so, whenever we, we complain or we see people complain, we should know and realize that it's probably something about in our lives that's going on that we need to first check and look into more than the thing that we're complaining about because the thing we're complaining about is a red herring that's not the real problem the real problem is the person that's doing the complaining there's something going on you know there was a guy who came again we we probably said this before but the man comes and he says doctor everything hurts and the doctor's like what he's like doctor everything hurts he's like everything he's like everything everything it just everything hurts i just doctor everything my life it just everything hurts come on can't be i never heard such a what kind of symptoms i never heard that symptom everything hurts not normal he says that i'm telling you everywhere on my body i touch it just it hurts doctor this says it can't be I, let me check let me look into this so the doctor he touches the man on his shoulder does that hurt you no mm -hmm. okay he touches the man on his leg. Does that hurt you? No. Touches his elbow. Does that hurt? No. Touches his chest. Does that hurt? No. And finally, the doctor smiles and picks up the man's finger. He says, look, Rohi, look, my friend. You have a, a cut. You have a paper cut on your finger. Everything you touch hurts. Not because your body is all aching. Because your finger is broken. Your finger has a cut on it. Right? Sometimes in life, we think everything's the problem. And really, not everything's the problem. Really, is a, a small thing in life that if we adjust, if we fix. That's why it's so powerful. You know, if things are bothering us, to speak to someone about it. And someone is not anyone. Someone is someone that's capable of helping us get through it. Right? If we're not happy. We're going through something. Sometimes speaking to a spouse, if they're capable, to a parent, if they're capable, to a friend, if they're capable, or to a therapist, it doesn't matter. Because sometimes life could actually be amazing. Sometimes we could actually have an amazing life and we could really be happy. And there's a tiny thing that we need to just adjust. A tiny thing, a little band-aid on my finger. And we think the solution is, my whole body, I got to start fixing everything. My whole life is upside down. Now your whole life is upside down. Relax. Take it easy. I promise. It's a small thing. You'll see it's a small thing. The solution doesn't have to be crazy all the time. I know we think it's counterintuitive. Sometimes we, we, we usually think if I have a big problem, then the solution's got to be a big solution. And I'm really going to have to you know, spend an arm and a leg on solving this. Not always. Sometimes... Something very small person, I'll give you an example. Person has very big, big problem. He always comes home and dinner's never ready. House is always, you know, flying. And he's starving and he gets home and he tries to be patient. After like three minutes, he's just like, you know, huffing and puffing. And then they get into a fight every single night because dinner is not ready exactly. And he's starving because he didn't eat since, you know, lunch. He's, and he's on some type of, you know, diet, who knows, whatever. And so he didn't eat from 12 and it's already 8 o'clock and he's stuck, right? Maybe have like a little snack before you walk into the house to hold yourself till dinner. You know what I mean? Sometimes like a small idea could save us a lot of problem and a lot of heartache. Right? Maybe just eat something real quick on your way home and you can stop. You can, we can save ourselves from so many Shalom Bayi problems.
Instead of coming home starving and then getting so annoyed if the food's not ready right away, have a little bar, have a little of a drink, have a little, a little food, something just to hold us, to hold us, so that when we walk into the house, our fuse isn't going to ignite in three seconds. Something to give us 30, to buy us a little bit more time. Again, this is just a, a silly example. Uh, I don't know anyone specific. I'm not talking to anyone. No one called me, I promise. No one called me yesterday on the chat that's listening. I don't know. People sometimes, they're like scrolling through the names. I wonder who's the rabbi talking about on this one. Maybe it was you. Is that you, right? I, I promise. I'm, no one specific on the chat tonight that I'm thinking of. I'm just giving you an example. Uh, and it wasn't me either, okay? If you're thinking, by the way, it's probably the rabbi. No, also, food's always ready when I get home. Baruch Hashem. God bless. Um, and I eat before, so <laughs> hence the, uh, the weight gain lately. Uh, but either way, a lot of times, sometimes, you know, a little solution, we could really boost our, our lives tremendously. Tremendously, we could really solve so many problems, so many problems. So, so that's, um, anyways, one interesting lesson from uh, yesterday's Mishnah. Some people, they're going to complain no matter what. They're going to complain no matter what. Okay. Um, one last thought, by the way, on this Mishnah before we go to today's Mishnah. I don't know if we're going to have time. Um, yes. Amen. Amen. Hashem bless my wife. Yes. God bless her. Thank you so much. I will forward the memo. Okay. Um, but I wanted to share with you one last very interesting thought. Why does the Torah list the ten times that we upset him in the desert? Isn't that Lashon Hara? It's an interesting question. No? By the way, I could ask this on any sin that's listed of anyone in the Torah. How come the Torah is allowed to tell us of a sin that they did? I'm not allowed to do that. I'm not allowed to come in this chat and say, Hey guys, good evening. Thank you for joining us on this beautiful Tuesday morning. And by the way, I just want to let you all know what X, Y, and Z did yesterday. <laughs> just in case you were wondering, I was walking in the street and I did see them. Just FYI, you know, just some, you know, no, no, no better way to start a shear than with some nice lush and horror. You know what I'm saying? I'm not allowed to do that. I'm not allowed to share with everyone in the chat gossip. And yet... Torah is telling us about the sins that certain people did. And everyone's writing the answer beautifully. That all of it is leto'elet. It's all something that we can learn from. The Torah is well above Lashon Hara. Excellent ideas. And the question is, okay, good, good. So what is the lesson that we are to learn from this episode? The 10 times that we tried Hashem. And lesson number one, lesson number one is look how patient HaKadosh Baruch Hu is. If it was me, if I was God, I'm done. Excuse me? Right? That's my thank you? That's how you thank me for the 10 plagues wasn't enough for you? And I split the sea wasn't enough? And now you're doubting if I could take you into Israel? You're calling the Egyptian God stronger than me? All right. See you later. Atutalur. Bye-bye. And good luck to you, my friend. Right? And I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ditch the Jews and I'm out. I'm out. I check out. Good luck and the desert and all of the elements. See you later, man. I don't need this. I don't need. I did not sign up for this. I'm God. I'll get another nation and I'll start over. But look at HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He's so patient. He will never give us up. No matter what we did wrong, no matter how many times we mess up, the Pasuk says, Lo me'astim velo ge'altim. This is a promise. Rabbi, could you please translate that? Okay, fine. The Pasuk says, I will never despise them. I will never be disgusted from them. God, kind of, you ready for this? God signed a forever ketubah. God signed a marriage agreement with us with no divorce option. There's no get, okay? Not a get refuser. No get. There's no get possible between us and HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He will never... That's an amazing... That's very comforting to know. Now again, He may punish us. He will try to bring us back slowly, slowly. Different, But God will never wipe out the Jewish people. He will never allow us to be extinct. Look at us. We're here today. Baruch Hashem. We are strong. We are successful. We are provided. We are doing. We are giving. This is all because of one reason. 
If anyone says, by the way, Rabbi, so, Mr. So-and-so, could you show me a miracle today? I want to see a miracle. Very easy. If someone asks you today, show me an open miracle, all you got to do, take your finger like this, go like this, you ready? And go like, no, I'm kidding. Take your finger and point at a Jew. All you got to do is point at a Jew. You want to see miracles? That, my friend, is a miracle. The fact that the Jews are still here. Bechol dor vador omdim alenu lechalotenu. They have tried to kill us not once, not twice, not ten times. In every generation, there's another Hitler, Yemach Shemo. There's another person, Haman, that's coming to kill the Jewish people. And we are here for one reason. We're here for one reason, because God swore. Lo me'astim velo I will never get rid of them. That's it. We are stuck with Hashem forever. That's pretty good, no? I'll take that any day. I'll take that any day. That's one beautiful lesson. But there is one more very, very powerful lesson over here. There are two types of people. There are some people that are very gullible. Please feel free to write in your synonyms for gullible for all of the chat lovers. Okay, some people are very gullible and some people are the opposite. They're very critical. Okay, is that fair to say those two opposites? Some people will believe whatever you tell them. Very naive. I like that word. Thank you, Marie. Some people are very naive. Some people are very critical. Okay, no matter what, they won't accept it. They're very tough, very hard to please, right? Everything the skeptical, whatever you tell them. They need to, I don't know, I got to look into it. I'm not sure. I don't, right? Some people, and I'm sure there are people that we know in our lives. You can tell them a story on the Shabbat table, by the way. And they're like, wow, amazing. Right? Some people. And then some people are like, come on, Rabbi, you don't really expect me to believe that that story ever happened. Right? You have those two types. And I'm sure at every their table, there are both types of uncles. Right? The skeptic. And then the one that's very naive. Um, and, and I don't want to give them, you know, I don't want to coin them in Hebrew. I don't want to get in trouble. But either way, those are two types of, of, of people, right? Some, the believer, uh, very easily convinced. And the other guy who is very hard to convince, okay? Now, sometimes we think, you know, and you'll speak to people that think that, the, uh, you know, the earlier generations with the... Our ancestors, our forefathers, whether it was in Europe or Syria or Lebanon, wherever you're from, Iraq, sorry to mean to offend you, you know, Temani, of course, whatever, um, uh, you know, okay, Europe, Africa, Asia, wherever, I said them all, okay, wherever you're from, you know, some people are like under the impression that they were so primitive. Let me tell you, my ancestors, they were so, yeah, so Tamim. Just whatever you told them, they believed. They believed in all this hgbg demon stories, angel stuff, and and um, you know today, come on, we're you know twenty twenty one, and let's get with the program a little bit and stop with this nonsense. And um, this is a little bit dangerous. You know why? Because we may then that could lead a person to say, if that's the case, that I'm not bound by the Torah. My ancestors accepted it, but they were very naive. God, Moses came, and he convinced. Could you? Yeah. There's no God. The Torah is not written by a God. There was this guy, Moses. He was an amazing salesman. He was very, very talented. Creative, imagination. Maybe a little bit on the, um, on the uh, you know... ADD side of the spectrum, but either way, the guy came along and he sold the, the Jew, this group of people that were very naive. He just sold them this whole religion and he convinced them out of nowhere to accept God and he brainwashed them and said, Hey guys, you just saw me speak to God, right? You just saw me. I just did it. Yeah, sure, Moses. Yeah, we just saw you. And now you have this whole guy that convinced all these primitive people and gullible people and naive people that there is a God and he sold them a book and then they taught their kids and that's how Judaism came about to be, you know, 3,000 years later. 
And by the way, what I'm telling you right now is not something that I'm making up. There are people today that believe this. That the whole Torah is made up. Moses made it up. He was an amazing orator. He wrote the Torah himself, sold it to a group of people that became the Jews many years later. And he started this religion from one guy. And we need to know that our ancestors were not gullible. They were not easygoing. They were not naive. They were stubborn as can be. And like us, Jews today, Jews today, right? You, you tell them, you know, uh, sir, please put your mask on. No, I don't want to put my mask on. I'm not, right? We, we are stubborn, right? You ever see Jews in a, on an airplane? Ladies and gentlemen, please do not stand up till the, you know, stop. You know, your seatbelt signs are off. And you know the Jews are up the second touchdown. You know what I mean? We don't, we don't, we don't follow rules. We don't pay attention. We don't care. We we do what we want, and we get what we get our way, right? And uh, sometimes a little bit embarrassing, by the way. Sometimes a little bit embarrassing. It's a little bit like a vechilul Hashem. But the Jews are not easygoing people. We're very tough. Actually, the Gemara says this, not me. The Gemara says in Masech Betza, there is no stubborn nation more than the Jewish people. There is no one, nobody, I tell you, that's more stubborn than the Jews. And why, again, the point of all of this, with all the miracles and still you were skeptical. We doubted Hashem. I don't know, God, you really can help me? You know why this is so important for us? Because then with all the skepticism, they eventually accepted HaKadosh Baruch Hu. So God didn't sell some primitive, naive people the Torah. No. They were fighting. They were fighters. They didn't, they didn't believe. They fact-checked everything. And they accepted it. And they accepted it. That's much more powerful. That is much more powerful. It's like convincing. Imagine I told you, I have this guy who's, you know, believer from day one of all of these st- stories. And he says there's a God. Okay, and then I bring you another guy who is a big thinker, rationalist, you know, uh, atheist, someone that really hard to please, hard to accept. And then I say, this guy believes in God. Which one's more impressive? Yeah, second guy, much more impressive. You know, if I bring you someone that's telling you stories of in Morocco, the grandma, she saw a demon and then she gave him an apple. Right? And I tell you the whole story. God bless. You know, I'm hearing these stories all day. My wife's half Moroccan. God bless him, you know. And then you hear you hear it from someone else who's the opposite. It's it's much more. Our ancestors, they were very very hard to please. They were not. Rabbi, are you saying they weren't Moroccan? <laughs> they were very hard to please, and that is the message of why the Torah lists time and again all of the times. They tested Hashem. We didn't accept God right away. We didn't accept Him. We wanted proof. And even after He proved, we wanted more proof and more proof. And again, there's another very powerful lesson. And this is what the Pasuk means. And we'll end with this. We say, we say in Shir Hashirim, Ani Homa. I am like a wall. What does it mean, a wall? You ever saw a wall? Try to move a wall. Good luck. It ain't going nowhere. The Jewish people are like a wall. We are so stubborn. And that's one of the greatest praises about us, by the way. The fact that we're stubborn. Because yes, stubborn means very hard to convince. But you know what else it means? It means that once you did convince them, you you own them forever. And, and, and that's what Moshe says to Hashem, by the way. Moshe says, God, I want you to know, if you're angry at the Jews for doing Chet HaEgel because they're stubborn, I'm here to tell you, God, that's exactly why you should stick with them. Because they will never forsake you for anybody else. And just like Hashem will never give us up. And just like God will never let go of a Jew. And God will never divorce us. That is a mutual relationship. And we will be willing to die for Hashem. The Jews have died. We will do it again if we have to. Am Israel. We have given up our lives. That is how unwavering our commitment to HaKadosh Baruch Hu is. We are ready to give up our lives for Him. We'll give up our lives for His mitzvot. Nobody 
could move us, no one can budge us. We are so stubborn, a beautiful type of stubborn. Okay, so this is, um, these are beautiful ideas from our Mishnah. Again, I'm sorry we didn't begin our new Mishnah, but I believe it is definitely, uh, it was worthwhile. Have a wonderful day, everybody. And God willing, we'll see you all tomorrow. Bye-bye.